would like to thank Dr. Samakia, Dr. Garuda, Ms. Amanda Room, and Binghamton University for once again co-sponsoring the second annual Lyme Disease Conference and hosting this wonderful venue. Southern Tier Lyme Support is a registered 501c3 not-for-profit whose mission is to help educate and spread awareness about Lyme and tick-borne diseases and to provide support for those suffering from it. We are 100% volunteered and rely on the generous support of individuals and businesses to be able to put on a conference of this magnitude. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ralph Garudo. Dr. Gar Go ahead. Dr. Garudo is a professor of biomedical anthropology at Binghamton University and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He has worked on infectious and chronic disease in human populations during his tenure at the National Institute of Health and at Binghamton University. Dr. Garudo has over 400 publications and is working on ecological, spatial, and human dynamics education for Lyme, in places where people live, eat, and recreate, in what is referred to as built environments. Please give a, please give a warm welcome for Dr. Ralph Garudo. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, for what I hope will be a uh, highly informative and uh, beneficial conference on Lyme and other tick-borne uh, diseases, uh, including our now five-year-long uh, research effort on Lyme in the Southern Tier and the Upper Susquehanna River Basin. Well, before I uh, get started, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Bagat Samakia, our Vice President for Research who will officially welcome you to Binghamton University. Um, his research division, uh, as some of you know, is and has been instrumental to the research mission of the university and in the economic development of the Southern Tier. Dr. Smart. Good morning. My name is Bagat Samakia. I'm the Vice President for Research at Binghamton University. And on behalf of Binghamton University, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you today to this really exciting event. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and uh, Professor Ralph Garuto for holding this meeting at Binghamton University and for inviting me to come and welcome you today. Uh, last year at this meeting, I clearly remember telling you that your work is important. Since then, I've had two close friends and affiliates who uh, have been infected with Lyme disease. One was caught early and, uh, and treated very successfully. The other was uh, late in diagnosis and suffered for months uh, taking antibiotics and continues to do so. Uh, I realize this is anecdotal, but it really brings it home. I mean, it's, uh, it's, if, it, if I was convinced last year, I'm much more convinced today that this is important. And Binghamton University is uh, really happy to, to help uh, in sponsoring these events and will continue to do so. I'm delighted to tell you that Binghamton University continues to grow its research and educational mission across the southern tier of New York. Uh, when you drove in this morning, you probably saw one more building that's under construction. That building uh, is referred to as the uh, Smart Energy Building. Uh, it's really the home of chemistry and physics. They will be moving in next year, and we'll, we're really excited about that. That will be the fourth building in this complex, and uh, it may be the last. We're not sure yet. Uh, the other really important development is that Binghamton University has identified health sciences as one of our key areas, uh, probably the most important area that we are investing in at the current time. Uh, as you may know, we are uh, building a school of pharmacy. The school has already been uh, in place with the dean in place, and she has started hiring some world-class faculty. Uh, it's the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and uh, its building has uh, already started construction in Johnson City. 
Uh, and the great story is that Johnson City will have more than one building. We're actually constructing a health sciences campus, uh, including the School of Nursing, uh, potentially uh, some part of uh, upstate medical, and uh, maybe most excitingly, room for pharmaceutical companies to come in and build infrastructure, both for research as well as for uh, development of new, new products and medications. So we really feel that uh, Binghamton University's participation uh, in uh, Johnson City will result in uplifting the entire area. So it's a really, really exciting opportunity. Uh, with that, I would like to once again thank you for being here today. I'd like to thank you for uh, bringing awareness to this very important issue. I think awareness is absolutely step one. Uh, many people are, do not realize how close this is and how widely it's spread and how quickly it's likely to continue to spread as uh, as global warming uh, continues to occur. With all of that, thank you again. Thanks for being here on a Saturday, and welcome to Binghamton University. OK, uh, can you hear me OK? Uh, <clears throat> our first speaker uh, today is Amanda Rome, uh, who will update uh, you on much of uh, the work that we've been doing over the past five years, our research program here at Binghamton University. Mandy's a doctoral student in our graduate program of uh, biological and biomedical uh, uh, anthropology here at Binghamton University and has spent um, much of her training and, and uh, has been conducting research on both chronic and infectious diseases uh, both in the U.S. and internationally. Her field work and laboratory research on uh, Lyme disease, it's focused on risk of infection with an end goal to develop, of course, public health uh, strategies to reduce the risk of tick uh, contact uh, and infection. Uh, she heads a team of 50 undergraduate students uh, working on the project who will spend the summer and fall, the summer and fall and, uh, of this year, conducting field and laboratory research in, uh, sorry, in the six county area, we've expanded the research um, to move from uh, Broome County into Shenango County, and now we're into a six county area, the upper entire upper Susquehanna River Valley. And depending on resources and funding, uh, our aim is to take uh, the southern tier, not in the proximate area, but if we can, all the way across the Ohio border. That, that's our goal. Um, so if you will, uh, let's welcome Amanda Rome. Good morning, everybody. First off, thank you, Dr. Samakia, for your support and for the opportunity to have Binghamton University and the Division of Research co-sponsor the Lyme Disease Conference for the second time. And thank you to Dr. Gerudo and the Southern Tier Lyme Support for organizing this conference. I'm excited to be here and share our research with you and hear from the rest of the speakers today. I'll be talking about the research that is going on here at SUNY Binghamton, which started back in 2011 with Dr. Gerudo. I joined the research team in 2012, and I'm going to fill you in on what we've been doing over the last five years locally and in the Upper Susquehanna River Basin. Just to cover the basics, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, what is Lyme disease? It's an infectious disease caused by a bacterial spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi. This bacterium is transmitted to people when an infected tick vector takes a blood meal from them. Who is at risk for contracting Lyme disease? All of us. We know this. Anyone spending time outdoors in areas that ticks may be are at risk. This is not an outdoorsman disease. You don't have to be a hiker. You don't have to be in the deep woods. You can be right in your own backyard, a state or city park, or right here on the Binghamton University campus. Different risk factors include coming in contact with leaf litter or unmaintained grass. If you have skin exposed, this creates an easier opportunity for ticks to attach to you. Of course, risks can be reduced by wearing bug spray with D or permethrin, which is only on your clothes, and by checking yourself for ticks. So very quickly, I would like to touch on the symptoms of Lyme disease. I'm sure Dr. Moorcroft and Dr. Horowitz are gonna go into much more detail about this later. 
As many of you know all too well, the symptoms of Lyme disease can seem endless. It can manifest in different ways. The telltale sign is the erythema migrans or the bullseye rash. However, this is not very common, as most of you know this. Uh, general flu-like symptoms, headache, fever, chills, fatigue, and muscle aches often affect those with Lyme disease. Bell's palsy is more common in children, which is paralysis, either temporary or permanent, of part of the face. And Lyme can lead to heart complications, joint pain, and can sometimes lead to neurological and psychological complications. And of course, this is not an exclusive list. The CDC does accept that 10 to 20% of individuals diagnosed with Lyme disease go on to develop post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome with symptoms persisting for months. And as many of us know, these symptoms can last much, much longer than that. Many of you are aware of the scope of the problem of Lyme disease in this area. I have maps of the geographic distribution of Lyme disease from the CDC. This notes cases from 2001 to highlight the exponential growth over the past 15 years. And remember, the CDC reports that there are 30,000 cases of Lyme disease diagnosed each year, but they have issued a statement in 2013 that they believe that the number is closer to 300,000, not 30,000. So each blue dot represents one case of Lyme disease. It's just randomly dropped in the county from which it was reported. So this map is from 2001, this is 2006, 2008, 2011, and 2013. So as you can see, this is a rapidly growing problem. I don't think this really surprises anybody in this room right now. So what is being done about it? As I mentioned, Dr. Grudo started this project back in 2011 when he noticed that there seemed to be a lot of ticks in the area and that the number of Lyme disease cases was growing rapidly. For those of you that were at this conference last year, I talked about the research that we were doing on, at Binghamton University and in the surrounding area of Broome County. Since then, we've expanded our research, as Dr. Grudo just said, into a five-county area, encompassing most of the upper Susquehanna River Basin. These counties that we're working in are in red in this picture, and the upper Susquehanna River Basin connects to the Hudson River Valley, which is highlighted in gray here, which is known for having the highest incidence of Lyme rates in the country. We have a minimum of two field sites within each of the counties that we're working in, and we are in Broome, Shenango, Delaware, Tompkins, and Tioga. We are assessing the distribution of ticks, the number of ticks, the number of infected ticks, the life cycle stage, sex, and human behaviors that increase the likelihood of tick contact, with an ultimate goal of developing a risk algorithm to predict human risk. As I will mention later, we are adding Otsego County into this research this summer. Our research is based on three general hypotheses. The first is that there is ecologically an uneven, uneven spatial distribution of infected ticks with high densities and distribution near to where human foot traffic or other human activities are more prevalent, which is what we are referring to as built environments. The second hypothesis is that social, behavioral, and demographic variables are fundamental to, to mediate the risk of human infection. Our third hypothesis is that a natural experimental model and a system science approach will allow for the development of mathematical models of risk and contact of an infection that may be useful for the development of strategies by the public health community. Our project is focused on the interaction between human, social, behavioral, and demographic elements combined with environmental, reservoir, and vector-driven factors that contribute to individuals encountering infectious ticks in physically fragmented eco-spaces, so built environments, such as playgrounds, neighborhood backyards, or other recreational or work areas in urban or peri-urban environments. As part of the model, we carry out a vegetation analysis along walkways, and we estimate the percent canopy cover and tree species. Um, we look at the understory, ground cover, leaf litter, soil depth, and the amount of mast or acorns or other nuts that are present. Dr. Julian Shepard, who is here today, works with us on this project and he is in charge of the, the ecological aspect of this project. We are currently working on preliminary analyses of the vegetation to assess whether or not certain, certain vegetative variables have an impact on tick density or the density of the primary reservoir for the infection, the white-footed mouse. Just to cover the basics of ticks, the tick species that carries, the Lyme, carries Lyme disease is Ixodes scapularis, which most of us more commonly know as the deer tick. These ticks are very, very small, as you all know. Larvae are not a threat to humans for Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, they have not taken a blood meal yet, and that is how they acquire the infection. 
Nymphs are the most dangerous stage to humans, as I'm sure many of you know all too well. They are about the size of a poppy seed, and they're most active in the summer when we're wearing the least amount of clothing and are in most contact with our environment. Adults can also transmit the infection to humans, but due to their larger size, they're about the size of a sesame seed, which is still small, we are more likely to detect them and pull them off before they have time to transmit the bacteria to us. The ticks, when they attach, the spirochete or bacteria lives in the midgut, so it does take a little while to migrate up into the saliva and into the human host. So the tick is taking in red blood cells and returning the plasma and potentially returning the bacteria into the human. And that's how we get infected. And the general rule of thumb is that it takes about 36 to 48 hours of attachment for a tick to successfully transmit the bacteria. Following a, an approved SUNY Binghamton protocol, we are trapping reservoir hosts that harbor the Lyme pathogen. <coughs> Primarily what we're looking at is the white-footed mouse, but we are also looking at meadow voles, meadow jumping mice, and short-tailed shrews. Trapping occurs in areas with fragmented ecosystems, so forested areas that are broken up by roads, buildings, or other barriers, um, increasing these, or creating these small closed-off ecospaces. And this is near high human foot traffic areas. It's been suggested that there is a pretty short window where Borrelia burgdorferi can be found in the human body after a person contracted the pathogen. After this window, it can be difficult to determine whether Borrelia burgdorferi is sequestered in the human host using ser current serologic tests that are available, although Igenix has a very good test, which you'll hear about very shortly. Um, sequestration of Borrelia burgdorferi can be examined in various organ tissues in the white-footed mouse and potentially be correlated to human symptoms of Lyme disease particularly the symptoms that are found in post-treatment Lyme or late-stage chronic Lyme disease. Rodents are sacrificed in the field and brought back to the lab where dissections are performed and tissue samples are taken from each organ to determine the presence of Borrelia burgdorferi. The bladder shows the highest infectivity at almost 40%, while the blood showed the lowest at 2%. It's worth noting that the brain tissue had an infectivity rate of 50%, but only two samples have been tested thus far. This summer we are going to be testing more samples. Of all of the white-footed mice specimens, 28% of them thus far have had one or more tissues that tested positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. And this is important because the white-footed mouse is a very competent reservoir. So by competent, we mean when a tick feeds on a mouse, if it's harboring the infection, 90% of the time that tick will get the infection from the mouse whereas other animals are not very competent, so if the tick feeds, there's a lower chance that they will contract the pathogen from them. Using a standard one by one meter corduroy cloth, we drag for ticks over low-lying vegetation and leaf litter. We use a very specific protocol so that we avoid being bitten ourselves, and we assess tick density by collecting ticks from three consecutive meters on each side of the walkways that we're looking at, and ticks in each meter are written down and we determine distance so we can look at the density of the ticks. And we note the location, the walkway, who collected it, what date, what time, and what the weather conditions were. And all ticks that are collected are placed in vials with alcohol and we, are, we bring them to the lab for analysis, which I will get into in just a moment. As I said, we're working in built environments or places that see a lot of human foot traffic. We define built environments as human modified areas such as homes, schools, workplaces, parks, industrial areas, um, where roads and highways serve as humans' most important habitat. This is an important means for understanding risk, which we believe can then be used for public health mitigation strategies. This is an example of one of our research sites. This is Wolf Park, right here in Binghamton. I'm not saying never go to Wolf Park. Um, but we label the maps and the trails, and we note the size, so we know exactly where we're picking up ticks, we know exactly where we're picking up rodents, so we can better assess what risk factors there are. Between October of 2012 and August of 2015, we've dragged over 300,000 square meters, which is about 189 linear miles long. So we've done a lot of work. And these are along areas of walkways with high human foot traffic because we're, we're interested in people. If there aren't people, Lyme disease isn't an issue. The dragging occurs at a minimum of two sites within each county, and more than 1,600 ticks have been collected thus far and the overall tick density is 5.3 per thousand meters squared, which is very high. I'm a very visual person, so to put it into perspective, to me, a thousand square meters doesn't mean much. So a thousand square meters is about a fifth of a football field, excluding one end zone. So if you think about how many times you cover that area in a day, 
Um, even simple things. If you're a student, if you're walking to campus from your dorm, if you're walking your dog, if you're going on a hike, if you're taking a walk. Simple things like this. If you're in Broome County and you cover that area, there are more than seven ticks that you could potentially be coming in contact with in this area. So I'm going to get into how many of them are infected in just a moment. Ixodes scapularis, or the deer tick, is identified microscopically in the lab, and we identify the life cycle stage, sex, and location, and we note this in a database, and recall the life stages that I just brought up a moment ago. So ticks are flash frozen in liquid nitrogen, and we grind them up and extract DNA, and we want to figure out if they are harboring the Borrelia burgdorferi spirochete. So we run PCR, and we confirm by sequencing the DNA to make sure that we are getting Borrelia. Here are the results for the percentage of ticks that are carrying Borrelia burgdorferi, the Lyme disease pathogen, in the counties that we've been working in. These results are pretty high. Um, the infectivity rates are very, very similar to the Hudson Valley, which, like I said before, borders the Susquehanna River Basin. Everyone's probably looking at Delaware County right now, where there are no ticks infected. I just want to note that I'm not saying that Borrelia burgdorferi and Lyme disease is not in Delaware County. Um, thus far, we have only picked up seven ticks in Delaware County, so we are returning this summer to assess what's going on there. Um, we could have, there could have been a lot of different reasons why we didn't get many ticks. Um, it could have been too dry, it could have been too wet, it could have been too hot, it could have been too cold. So we're going to go back again this summer and we're going to be working with our colleagues, Drs. Dana Reif Santos and Dr. Elizabeth Frisbee, and we're going to make a better assessment of what's happening in Delaware County this summer. In addition to the high density of ticks in the Upper Susquehanna River Basin, the prevalence of Borrelia burgdorferi in infected ticks in our study is similar to the overall reported prevalence in the Hudson River Valley and higher on average than counties just west of the Hudson River Valley, than west of the Hudson River. The crude incidence rates are noted in each county on the figure that's shown here. If prevalence of the Lyme pathogen in these counties in our region is an indication of the expected number of reported Lyme disease cases, then we are proposing that Lyme disease incidence rates that are reported to the New York State Department of Health are well below what should be expected for our data. We suggest that there is a severe lack of recognition of Lyme cases by the medical community and thus under-reporting of Lyme cases in our region, or we may be on the cusp of a rapid increase of the number of Lyme cases in the southern tier over the next five years, moving slowly east from the Hudson River Valley, west from the Hudson River Valley, my apologies, and likely south from Pennsylvania. A very important aspect of our research is attempting to understand human demographic and behavioral patterns that affect risk outcome and are crucial to the development of Lyme disease risk models. Observations are conducted on high foot traffic walkways, the same ones that we collect rodents on, the same ones that we collect ticks from, and also the same ones that we are doing the vegetation analysis on. Both demography, so the total number of people by gender, and behavior, so walking, sitting, leaning or lying on various types of ground cover, levels of skin exposure, clothing, footwear, are all recorded and each walk, on each walkway over the course of an 11 hour day for three days per week. We also note garbage cans, food litter, animal sightings, and other additional information that can be helpful to tr keep track of what may be attracting potential reservoir hosts to the area and thus bringing infectivity to ticks. An example of our preliminary data for risk events observation, this is during the fall of 2013 on the Binghamton University campus. This is about two months of observation. The data you see here encompasses 548 hours of observation along 23 different walkways. So the number of risk events projected out for the entire fall would of course be much higher because remember this is only three days per week. By risk events, we mean the number of times that an individual presents on a particular walkway with some sort of clothing or behavioral risk. In the full database, literally involving thousands of pages, is currently being proofed and analyzed so that we can fully determine exactly how many people are at risk. Of almost 10,000 events observed, over 70% of people had some sort of risk. This is behavioral and clothing data from this past summer from the work we did. What we're seeing in these same areas, again, where we collected rodents, where we collected ticks, 50 to 100% of people are at a clothing risk or doing some sort of risky behavior. This is in all five counties, so the vast majority of people are at risk. And this is summer, so this is nymphal season. And this is, as most of us know, the largest threat to humans because nymphs are very small and they could have acquired the pathogen when they were a larva and we won't detect them when they're on us. So they are 
very easy to transmit the pathogen. Some of my previous research involved looking at the seasonality of, Lyme, of the Lyme pathogen. As we know, summer is acknowledged as the most dangerous time for human infection, but looking at this data, orange represents the percentage of ticks infected with the Lyme pathogen, and blue represents the density of ticks. We see that this may not necessarily be the case, that summer is the most dangerous. However, though density seems to be the highest in summer, tick infectivity is lowest at that time. This does make sense because nymphs have only taken one blood meal at that point, so they've only had one opportunity where the adults have had two opportunities, and adults are active in the fall and the spring. However, if people are not aware and checking themselves for ticks and trying to prevent tick bites during the fall and spring, I would argue that these seasons are also very dangerous. <coughs> you won't be able to read this, but we're attempting to model the risk of infection. To do this, we utilize mathematical functions based on given ecological and human behavioral variables. Ecological variables include mask season, so acorns, humidity, temperature, and precipitation. Some human behavior variables of interest to this model include the presence of food and leaf litter and human demographics. This model is being built in two phases, and this first phase is what we call a causal loop diagram, and that's what's pictured here. I know it looks very confusing, but this relates the ecological and climate variables to, tech, to tick density, um, density of infected ticks, and mouse density and mouse infectivity. For phase two, we have created a simulation model, which is shown here. The blue parameters indicate ones that we are calibrating from the model, and red parameters indicates data that we have collected. To compare the output of the simulation with historical data, we used the New York State Department of Health data for Broome County, and we scaled it down according to the ratio of campus to the Broome County population. We calibrated the simulation model against the historical data series using the maximum likelihood estimating approach the output shown here, after several iterations, matches the predicted number of cases through the simulation model with the actual number of Lyme disease cases that's being reported from Broome County. The second phase of this model will relate the density of infected ticks obtained from phase one to human risk of infection. Variables of interest for the first phase of the model and their hypothesized correlations to tick density are modeled in this diagram. Another study being conducted is looking at dog bloods for the presence of Borrelia burgdorferi. Samples were obtained from a veterinary hospital in Shenango County. We are looking to see how many dogs are infected, meaning they have been bitten by a tick. If dogs, which are typically household pets, are carrying ticks, there's an opportunity for these ticks to hop off of your dog and hop onto you. Therefore, making dogs a sentinel species for Lyme in this area, which would increase the human risk for Lyme. We've tested 362 dog bloods, and we found that almost 35% of them are harboring the Lyme disease spirochete. And there's a poster in the rotunda about this. We have two students that have been working on this project, so they will be here this afternoon if anybody would like to speak to them. I just want to note, I am not saying get rid of your dogs and don't get a dog. Um, they, I mean, it, it is an added risk factor, but if you check your dog for ticks, if you check yourself for ticks, Dogs love tick checks, they love being pet, so. We also have a component of our project to collect ticks from deer. We're looking at what role deer play, because we call it the deer tick, in the spread of the Lyme pathogen. The current scientific literature is very conflicted as to whether or not deer play a role in the spread of the Lyme pathogen. The pathogen prevalence in ticks on deer is significantly lower than ticks collected from dragging. So 39 to 43% infectivity in Broome County is what we're seeing when we're picking them up from the ground. We're picking them up off of the trails. Um, it's less than 2% when you pick them off of deer in the same, way, in the same region, in the same county, in the same town. The difference is also very large in Shenango County with 39% of ticks from the ground and 6% of ticks from the deer. From these results, we conclude that deer contribute to the spatial distribution of ticks, so they bring them into your, your yard. As you can see in this picture, they serve as a primary feeding site and breeding site for adult ticks but they do not aid in maintaining and spreading the Lyme pathogen to ticks. This summer, as Dr. Grudo said, we're gonna to return to all five counties, which we discussed today, which are in red, and we're also gonna add Otsego County in yellow to complete the Upper Susquehanna River Basin. And after this is complete, our goal is to move westward to complete the entire Southern Tier region of New York. So I would like to take this time to discuss current research that I've started. I'm looking into the impacts that Lyme disease has on human health and lifestyle changes that Lyme patients go through. 
This research is in the form of an online survey through a paper survey is also an option. I'm recruiting both Lyme and non-Lyme individuals. Through this survey, I hope to better understand the impact of Lyme disease on human health and hope to provide individuals, researchers, public health officials, and medical professionals a framework from which to increase awareness, direct future research, implement public health mitigation and prevention strategies, and potential for better treatment and management options. If you have an interest in taking part in this survey, please see me at some point today. There will also be flyers at, on the back table by the Binghamton University table by the stairs. And we have, you may leave your email address with me and you can put it in a box, I can email you the survey. If you got the green bag when you came in, there is a flyer in there where you can take the survey. And thank you very much. So in conclusion, these data suggest that built environment, so places where people live, work, go to school, and recreate, within the upper Susquehanna River Basin have a high tick density and high infectivity rate. This is a cause for concern regarding disease transmission to human. In all five counties, the combined New York State Department of Health reports an incidence rate of 43.7 cases per 100,000 people. With the high tick infectivity and high human risk, this may suggest that the human infection rates may be underreported in our area, suggesting the need for greater public health outreach and recognition by the medical community and for the development of risk management models by public health officials. We have also learned that dogs may serve as a sentinel species to increase rates of human infection and also that deer, although helping to distribute ticks over large geographic areas, do not appear to aid in passing on and maintaining the Lyme pathogen in tick populations. I just want to say a big thank you to Dr. Gerudo, who is the PI on the project, Rita Spathis, who runs the molecular lab, Dr. Shepard, who is in charge of the ecology team, and thank you to Dr. Santos, Dr. Frisbee, and Dr. Curtis, who collaborate with us on different aspects of this project. And a huge thank you to all of the students that have helped with this massive amount of field work that has been done over the summer and also throughout the academic year. Um, they've been a huge help to the process, and we have a lot of lab work going on, so they are a big help. And of course, a special thanks to those that, that have continued to fund this research. So thank you very much.